Is the recording started? Recording started? Huh? I think you can stop now. Okay. All right. So, uh, my name is Ian Romanek. I'm with the Open Source Technology Center at Intel. I'm one of the main developers on the GLSL compiler in Mesa. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the experience that we've had over the last three years with a tree like IR for the, the OpenGL shading language. Um, so I'm going to spend a bit of time kind of going over a little bit of the background of the current compiler architecture and how we, we ended up with this IR, um, talk about a bunch of the problems that we've discovered with the IR architecture over, over the last three years, um, and then talk a bit about ways to, to evolve the, the existing IR into, into something better that doesn't have a bunch of those problems. Um, so we started this project in around 2010, and at that time, the GLSL compiler was kind of a disaster. Um, technically, it supported GLSL 1.20, but there were a lot of real-world shaders that just wouldn't compile or um, generated completely awful code. Um, it was written using a custom parser generator. Uh, so the guy who wrote it, a guy named Michael Kroll, uh, basically wrote his own version of Yak to write the compiler, um, and he wrote it as, and, and, and to put this in all fairness, he wrote this as an undergrad thesis project at his university, so that he got anything working by himself that could actually generate code and compile anything was a pretty spectacular accomplishment. But as you know, something that you want to be able to run real applications, um, it just, it just wasn't good enough. Um, and it wasn't really an architecture that anyone else could understand or maintain or that we could make improvements on. Um, in addition to the, uh, uh, the sort of custom parser generator, uh, the, the IR that it used um, used a register stack. So basically like the old 387. Uh, it was, yeah, there was, there was a bunch of really weird choices in it. Um, so we set out to rewrite it. And at that time, none of the people involved with the project, um, it was primarily myself and, and one other guy at Intel who were going to be working on this, um, we were graphics people and not compiler people. So we set out to find out what sort of the, the state of the art was in, in production compilers. And we, we ended up looking primarily at two sources uh, at the time. One was Advanced Compiler Design and Implementation by Stephen Munchnik, um, which is a really, really excellent book. If you're interested in compilers, it is a really good source. But it kind of has a disadvantage that it was published right just on the cusp of when SSA was becoming mainstream. So there's a chapter about SSA in it that he kind of prefaces with, well, there's this kind of new thing that people are trying, and we'll see if it takes off. Um, the other uh, source that we looked at a lot was uh, David Hansen's classic text, um, A Retargetable C Compiler, which is the book um, that, if you've ever heard of the uh, LCC compiler, uh, is basically the book about that compiler. One of the interesting things about that book is he developed a, um, a fairly sophisticated system called Elberg for writing machine description languages. And so we, we sort of had this vision of, well, we have all these different weird GPU backends that we want to be able to support. Wouldn't it be great if we could just write a description of when you see this kind of sequence of things, you can generate these instructions to do it, and it has this kind of cost. Um, and, and his system had a really sophisticated uh, um, dynamic programming architecture so that it would um, kind of like an AI search algorithm try to find the, the least cost instruction sequence for a, a particular set of IR. Um, so we kind of had these, these two things as, as what, what we were building from. So 
from that, and, and particularly because of things that, uh, the way that the Elberg system works, it wants to know a lot about how values generate, how partial values generated in expressions are then later used. Um, unfortunately, it also really wants to be integrated with your CSE pass and register allocation. And that's kind of where us not being, being compiler experts, we, we, we sort of missed that bit. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what we ended up with is a, a tree-like expression IR um, where we have a, a base class of R values and then all the different sorts of, of R values derived from that. Uh, sort of the most important one being IR expression where we have an, an, the, the uh, an enum for the operation, whether it's an add or a multiplier or whatever, and then the set of operands that that, that uh, expression takes. So we get these, these kind of trees like this, um, where you've got a, a multiply, an add, and then a min and max expression. And so we could evaluate this tree and by, you know, in a fairly natural uh, um, tree visiting uh, way, be able to figure out, okay, this is a and actually I should say mad uh, with, with saturation. Right? So we can take this whole tree and figure out that it should be a single instruction. Um, and, and we have a few passes or a few uh, code generation bits in the compiler that work like this, uh, being able to convert these sort of really common uh, min-max trees uh, to, to generate saturate modifiers, add multiplies to generate mads, there's a whole I think six different kinds of trees that we can figure out are actually a, um, a LERP instruction. There's also a bunch of um, um, algebraic optimization passes that, that exploit this, this tree-like nature so we can identify that if you have a POW instruction that's two to some power, we can actually generate the, the EX2 instruction instead. Um, but it turns out that GPUs tend to have really regular instruction sets with primarily very, very simple instructions. And they don't have complex addressing modes. And primarily the benefit that you get out of being able to um, do sophisticated analysis of these trees is if you have CPUs that have crazy instructions or crazy addressing modes, you know, like a scaled plus offset kind of addressing mode or post increment addressing modes or things like that, that you can identify those in the trees and be able to automatically generate those instructions. GPUs don't have any of that. Um, so a lot of this potential from these trees we discovered uh, when we were quite deep into it, we weren't really going to be able to realize that potential. Plus, these trees can have uh, various rotations and permutations. So if you want to be able to generate a MAD instruction, you have to identify this kind of tree and that kind of tree and all other kinds of weird rotations, including transposing the, where the min and the max are to be able to, to generate the saturates. So all, uh, the, being able to evaluate these trees turned out to be, in practice, a lot more complex uh, than we had anticipated or, or had hoped. Um, we also have um, difficulties with code generators for it. So this particular tree ends up being a single instruction. Uh, but there's a bit of difficulty with the code generator if you have a sequence that's going to generate multiple instructions because then as the code generator is recursing back up through the tree, it has to keep track of where it has stored these partial values so that then the next layer up in the tree can know that it has to, so the, you has to know that the multiply stored its value in register 26, so then when you would generate the add instruction, knows that, okay, that has to come from, red, that source has to come from register 26. And that ended up making the, the code generation a, kind of a nightmare. Um, it also makes doing any kind of a CSE pass exceptionally difficult because you have these crazy, crazy big, big trees, um, and you have to do your 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 CSE on subparts of of the trees. Um, 
We also have difficulty identifying these kinds of sequence if, say, in the middle here, there's a swizzle operation so that the result of the multiply gets swizzled um, and be able to identify that when we're trying to generate the, the MAD instruction. Um, and it, it yeah, it, it ended up being a lot more complex than we had anticipated. Plus, you have the difficulty of if you have, if what the developer has written is some piece of code like this, where your multiply and your add don't end up sort of naturally in the same tree, the tree processor will completely miss, oh, hey, I can generate the value. Of, if, if X isn't used anywhere else, I can generate the value of Y using a single MAD instruction. Uh, to overcome this, we had to write this really awful pass in the, in the compiler called, uh, if you look in the, in the Mesa source code, there's a file called uh, opt tree grafting that will try to find these kinds of places and, and merge those, those trees together. So it'll take the, the tree that generates X here and put it in place of the dereference of, of X in that expression. And it's, it's a horrible piece of code. I, I feel very sorry that, that Eric had to, had to write that, that code. Um, and I've had to apologize to him several times <laughs> for it. Um, so in addition to expressions, we also have um, another kind of R value is our dereferences. Um, the simple of which is the, the simple variable dereference. Um, and there are other more, more complex dereferences. So, that it, so there's a, a separate one of these subclasses, each for um, array dereferences and for structure dereferences. So if you have some complex thing, like you have an array of structures, and that structure contains an array of structures that contains an array of structures, et cetera, et cetera and you want to get at some actual data member in that, you end up with a whole tree to get at, to dereference all the way down through that array of structures of et cetera, to get down to that actual piece of variable that, that you want. Um, and kind of the end result is you have a huge subtree for this with a lot of pointers that you have to walk through while you're doing this recursive process just to figure out that what you actually wanted was register 48. Um, so this makes complex shaders, especially complex shaders, um, take up huge amounts of memory in the IR. There are a couple of games uh, available on Steam that right now on a 32-bit machine have difficulty compiling all of their shaders because they exhaust VM. So clearly this giant tree structure for a value, and, and it's not their fault, right? It's entirely our fault because we have this extremely verbose um, set of, of data structures for e expressing these things. Um, so we kind of have three main kinds of R values. We have expressions, we have these trees of variable dereferences, and we have um, constants. And dereferences are used, the, the, have the exact same structure for dereferencing uh, temporaries. In, so both temporaries that the, um, that the application has explicitly declared that only exist during the lifetime of the shader and temporaries that are automatically generated by the compiler. Um, uniforms, shader inputs and outputs uh, uh, all end up looking the same in the compiler, even though at the code generation back end, they, they may be treated differently. And these end up being plunked into the uh, assignment instruction, which has a dereference for the left-hand side and then some R value tree for the right-hand side. Um, and, a, and a condition modifier on it. So we, we put that in there with the intention that any assignment could be a conditional assignment. Many GPUs have either uh, predica predicated execution or have explicit condition codes um, 
on all of the, the assignments so that the uh, instruction may not write its value uh, depending on the value of the condition code. So we kind of had this, this, this thinking that we would use this automatically as we're generating code and flattening out if statements and doing things like that and be able to, to generate things uh, compactly and make it easier on the code generation back end. But the problem is this right hand side isn't just add x and y, it's potentially this giant tree of, of gook with that's going to generate, you know, 46 intermediate values and, you know, maybe all of those need to be conditional, maybe they don't. It kind of depends on the back end. Um, so we have this, this thing in there that should have made things easier, uh, but in practice actually made things quite a bit more complicated because now all of the optimization passes when they're trying to do value tracking or do dead code elimination or things like that have to be aware that maybe an assignment occurs or doesn't because they're, they're all conditional. And it, it just sort of, it, it, it made things more, more difficult instead of making them easier. So we had all these great ideas and all these things that, that really seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and most of it turned out to just be painful and, and sort of make everyone's life much more difficult. Um, the only thing that out of all of this that sort of panned out was when we created the tree structure, um, we created a, a set of uh, sort of helper classes to make it easier to uh, traverse through the trees and only execute operations at certain uh, kinds of nodes in the tree so you could do things on them uh, to make writing independent optimization passes a lot easier. Um, and that has worked out, but it's been kind of a double-edged sword. Um, so one, on the one hand, it's really easy to uh, you know, if you want to write a new optimization pass that identifies a certain kind of sequence and replaces it with a different kind of sequence, it's really easy to write those. You can sit down and probably write two of them before I'm done with this talk. The flip side of that is we've got about 27 of those. And so now we have all these different optimization passes that operate completely independently and most of them, once they've done some modifications on a set of instruction trees, have to stop because now they've changed information that they, they later need and basically start over. So through a whole optimization sequence, we end up running through all of these trees hundreds of times. Um, so. We're walking through these trees, through all these pointers, through these extremely verbose dereference structures. Um, it's extremely, I'm not even gonna say it's cache unfriendly, it's, it's downright cache mean. <laughs> um, and, and the performance of it is fairly awful, right? So we've, we've kind of made this trade off that it's easy to do this thing, so we've done the hell out of this thing, <laughs> and, and it's, it's ending up being uh, fairly costly. So I think the first thing that we need to do is, um, is attack sort of the, 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 the wordiness of, of uh, these, these IR trees and, and try to get some, some memory back. So one of the things that we should have done in the first place is basically have two different sorts of ways that, that we keep track of values. Um, Anything that is or has an array, just pretend that we're on a CPU and give it some memory locations. Fortunately now, we actually have a lot of infrastructure for doing this kinds of thing, uh, the, these kinds of things in GPU programs thanks to uh, uniform buffer objects where you can create a region of memory that has a bunch of variables in it that you can directly access from the shader. So we have a bunch of this infrastructure now and transitioning to, at least during the initial compilation phases, just putting everything that's an array into sort of a fake UBO um, and then assuming that we'll optimize it out later uh, would be pretty easy. And then everything else, just give it a fake register. 
out of a pool of, of infinite registers, right? So just have uh, a 32-bit register set. Um, and then keep a mapping of register number to, uh, to IR variables so that we can, we can still um, be able to tell that this register is actually a vertex shader input if we need to, to generate different code for that. Um, as a, a follow on to this, we could also include uh, swizzle information on, on the register usage. So even though we would have this, this extra mapping to say that register 238 is actually variable foo, um, it, it would end up being a lot smaller than the current IRD reference system for a few reasons. Uh, the biggest one is that there's one mapping per variable instead of there being an IRD reference for every time you try to use the variable. In addition, all of the sort of compiler generated temporaries and through, through a bunch of our optimization passes, we generate a pretty good number of, of, um, of temporaries. None of those actually need IR variables anymore. You can just say, okay, I need a temporary. It's the next fake register. And not even, not even have this mapping because you don't need it. it. That variable isn't visible to anything. And then also, after the shader has been fully linked, you can just throw away the map. You can either, complete, either completely throw it away or at least just reduce it down to only including um, things that are visible external to the shader, like the shader inputs or the set of uniforms. So that ends up being a, a much smaller uh, set of things to, to keep track of. You would also need a, a similar kind of mapping for, the, for arrays so that you know that a particular base address is mapped to the, the base of a, a particular variable. Um, so in order to make this work, we'd need a couple of, of additional optimization passes that we, that we don't have now, but for, to support, for supporting UBOs, we actually should have now. Um, one is a pass that kills redundant loads and redundant stores of, um, of arrays. So if, you, so if you're only, at, so if you tell, okay, I already, at, loaded index six of this array into register 85, then the next time someone accesses register six, you just, or index six, you just pull from that, that same register instead of reloading it. And likewise with, uh, with stores. We don't have stores on, on UBOs yet, um, but we will pretty soon with, um, I can't remember what the extension is called. There's some GL4 extension that, that adds that, that capability. Um, So then if you've managed to kill all of the redundant loads and stores of, uh, of an entire array, then you can kill its entire mapping to memory and just keep that array uh, in registers. Uh, since we have a, a lowering pass already for uh, GPUs, most GPUs can't do non-constant indexing of certain kinds of arrays. Um, so quite a few of them can't do dynamic indexing of uh, the arrays of the output from the vertex shader to the fragment shader, for example. Um, we already have a lowering pass that converts that kind of dynamic indexing to some really ugly, awful code um, that makes it look like a bunch of constant accesses. Uh, with those optimization passes and the existing lowering pass, we would end up with parity with what we have today. So then what we end up with is instead of the current tree of Gook, we'd end up with a bunch of UBO loads and something that looks like this for our, our R values. Um, so still, because it's going to still derive from, I think my laser died, uh, from IR R value, it still has type information, so we haven't lost that. Um, and this structure on LP64 systems has the same size as uh, the existing IRD reference variable, but it's uh, what larger by four bytes on LP32 systems. But you don't have the giant tree of these anymore for any kinds of you know 
array of structure of array accesses. And you also no longer need to have um, swizzle expressions as, as R values. So we've increased on, on LP32, we've increased the size of an individual node, but we've reduced the, um, the depth of the trees. So it, it, it still is, is a winning trade-off. Um, so this right here would dramatically simplify um, code generation backends and would dramatically reduce our memory usage. It's also worth noting that um, if you, after having done linking and done dead code elimination, if you make a quick pass over the instructions and sort of compact out holes in the used registers, you could keep track of the highest register number that's been used and the code generation backend, if it says, oh, the highest register number that, you know, highest fake register number that was used in this program is 48 and I have 128 registers, then the backend doesn't even have to bother doing its own register allocation pass. Um, so for simple shaders, this would actually make code generation quite a bit faster too, because you don't even have to bother with um, it, what, at least on the i965 driver, is the single most expensive part of the code generator. So that, that seems like winning. So the next place that we want to, to go after having re reduced our memory usage is we want to get to uh, what I'm going to call flat land. Get out of this, this forest of, tr of trees and get to a flat looking IR. And I think that that would look something like this, where you've kind of smashed a single IR expression into an IR assignment. So you have the register of the left hand side, the operation that's going on, um, the registers that are the right hand side, and, and the right mask. And you know, already from this where we're sort of giving everything its own fake register and we've, we've flattened things out. You can almost smell SSA coming, right? It's like, it's almost there already, but there's, there's a, a couple of uh, additional things that, that, that need to happen to actually uh, make, make that work out. Um, and there are a couple other R value like things that, that, that need some treatment. Um, so our calls, uh, we have a, a, an additional instruction for, for function calls that, that pass the list of parameters. Already kind of look like this, where the, the call has a location where it's going to assign the, the return value of the call and then the function that's being called and, and all the list of, of parameters. Um, that would get refactored into uh, a new kind of class hierarchy. Um, also, texture instructions are texture instructions are kind of a mess in, in the current IR because GPUs keep adding new texture instructions that have additional parameters. So we kind of keep growing this this horrible uh, in, instruction node in in the IR. And I think what we want to do with that is just throw that away and make texture function texture instructions look like function calls in the IR that are um, and, and kind of take a um, take a page out of the out of the LLVM playbook and and use uh, what they call intrinsics and just have specialized intrinsics for for uh, texture instructions instead of having them be specific opcodes. So if we flatten things out like this, we've, we've lost some information. We, we no longer know how, the, how this value that's generated by a single instruction is later used, right? So if we have a, a multiply instruction, we only have that multiply instruction in isolation. We have no idea when examining that that the only thing that ever uses this multiply instruction is an add instruction, and that add instruction is only used by a min, and that's only used by a max. So we don't have any way to generate the mad sat instruction anymore, at least not directly. Um, and also some of, our, some of the, um, the optimization passes that want to take 
different kinds of sequences of instructions and replace them with a different single kind of instruction uh, become more difficult. So a lot of those instructions we could probably sort of immediately generate as this, what I'm, gonna, what I'm calling IR calculation, which is I think a fairly terrible name, but I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything else better to call it when I, when I was writing these slides. Um, if when we were going, say, directly from the AST to, uh, to IR, even if we could gen generate the, the MAD SAT then, um, almost all of the optimization passes that we currently have create new opportunities to generate the, these, these complex instructions. Um, this is especially true for the LERP instruction. Um, we had a LERP pass that operates at the high level IR, and then we found that because of optimizations that happened in our back end on the, the lower level IR that, that the 965 back end uses, that even it was creating more opportunities for to generate LERP instructions. So we had to create a, a pass that operated on, on that IR. So we have multiple things that are trying to, to generate uh, LERP instructions. Um, so we still need to be able to, to recognize these things that, that were really sort of tree-like flows of, of expressions to, to be able to generate more complicated things. So we could, you know, go backwards from this, back to a tree, run a tree grafting p pass on the, on the forest of trees, then use that to go back into this form to get those complex instructions. But I, I felt myself getting a little bit sick just saying that, <laughs> much less having to write that code. Um, and I think if I make Eric write that code again, uh, he'll, he'll cut me. So. Um, so the way that compilers that don't have tree-like IRs uh, traditionally do this, and that, by the way, is pretty much all of them, um, is using UD chains, or at least a simplified form of UD chains. And I know at least one person in the audience is, al is already thinking, but you don't need UD chains with SSA. No, no, that's not, not entirely true. Um, so even referring back to you know, one, of the, one of the original papers about SSA, um, they addressed the issue of UD chains and that you don't need UD chains for as many different things with SSA as you did without SSA. So for example, you don't need UD chains for doing CSE or for doing dead code elimination or a bunch of other things. But you do still need them for doing instruction generation and a very small set of uh, optimization passes. The advantage that you get with, at, with SSA is that you get a whole bunch of simplifying assumptions about your UD chains and they're a lot easier to generate and keep up to date and you can represent them more compactly. And for what we need to maintain um, code generation parity with what we have today, we can get away with a really, really simplified form of UD chains that, so that we won't have to, so a really simplified form of UD chains that roughly matches what we would still need with SSA so that we won't have to really throw away any code when we make that transition and the, and the two can, can live um, side by side. Um, so primarily what we need to know is, is within a single basic block, when is a value only used by one other thing and, and, and vice versa. When um, since it's within a particular basic block, when does a value that's consumed only have a single um, reaching definition? Any other cases, we don't, even, we don't even need any information. Just, okay, don't even bother tracking that. Um, so we can get away with a really, really simplified form that we would generate directly from the tree and be able to keep, keep up to date in a, in a really uh, easy way. Um, so one other thing that we can't do today um, and, and for which we would 
uh, need UD chains is to be able to detect cases like this where we have two different uh, and I believe that we would get this after going to SSA. I wouldn't want to try to do this before, where we have two different reaching definitions of X, but if we just pushed that, that clamp back up into each of those basic blocks, we could generate um, a, a, a DP with saturate on both of those and be able to cut an instruction out of, out of what we generate today. What we generate today is two dot products and then an extra move with, with saturate today that would that is, is useless. I actually, we might, in the back ends, we might have, I actually think in the 965 back end, we have a pass that tries to, to push the, those, um, tries to eliminate those, those moves with, with saturate. Um, I don't know if, if other back ends have, have similar thing. Um, so there's a couple other bits of, of dirty laundry in, in the current compiler architecture. That, that I wanted to, to bring up. Um, they're kind of outside, they're, they're sort of orthogonal to uh, the, the mistakes that we made with, with the IR. Uh, we don't explicitly track basic blocks. Um, we kind of implicitly have them because of the way that, uh, that if instructions and, and some of the loop in instructions are, are structured, um, but there isn't an explicit structure that's Here's a basic block, um, and that ought to get fixed. And, and I think that that would will sort of be fixed at, when we do a, a transition to, to flatland. Um, it was really difficult to keep basic blocks before uh, the, the, the tree structure made it a lot harder. As soon as you tried to move things around in the trees, it would invalidate your basic blocks, and you would basically have to build them from scratch. So we just didn't didn't bother. Um, we also don't have an explicit IR for switch statements. Um, when at, at, at AST level, when a switch statement is encountered, it's immediately translated through some really horrific code um, uh, into a, a sequence in, a sequence of, of if statements, which most of the time is what your GPU is going to do. However, if, your, um, if the switch value is uniformly constant, almost every GPU would be better off using a jump table. Um, and we have absolutely no way to generate that. We haven't cared about it too much because if you look at ShaderDB, there are exactly zero occurrences of switch. So, um, Part of that, though, is an artifact of there not being a lot of, of games for Linux, and especially not a lot of games for Linux that aren't games that were also targeting consoles. And the, uh, PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 couldn't really do switch statements, so nobody wrote them in their shaders. But now that there's a new generation of consoles, there's a, a pretty good probability that we're going to start seeing some of those. Um, the other thing that needs to, to die in a fire is the explicit generation of the AST. So when we first started on the compiler project, um, in Mesa, any files, because of supporting Windows, um, any files that were, that, were, that were generated as part of the build process uh, were tracked in source control. So if you had a yak grammar file, the C file that gets generated from it was committed to source control. So it meant that every time you modified the grammar, you had to remember to commit this other file too. And people were really horrible about that. And so it was very common that the committed.c file was 12 versions beyond, behind uh, the the uh, the grammar file, um, so I wanted to keep ha I wanted there to be as few changes as possible to the grammar file. So what I did wh when when writing that was have it explicitly create an AST and then process that AST in a in a C file into the actual IR. So there's this explicit step there. Um, 
now that we don't do that ridiculous thing of committing the, the generated C file to source control, um, it would make a lot more sense to do a bunch more of that work actually in the, the YAC file and skip that, that step of generating this, this other uh, explicit AST since the, you know, the, the grammar itself generates it implicitly. Um, so we would ought to be able to uh, you know, cut some, some transient memory usage and, and probably get a little bit more performance out of the, out of the, uh, the compiler front end that way. We kind of didn't care about it too much uh, because shader compilation time wasn't showing up that much in uh, applications that existed for Linux in uh, 2010. Uh, but now, you know, the, the same applications that, that run out of, out of VM on 32-bit systems um, take quite a bit of, of time to, to compile everything. Um, I think the one that hurts us the most is Dota 2, that if I remember correctly, when you run it without any extra options, at startup it tries to compile 11,000 shaders. Yeah, that would be why it runs out of VM. Right? Um, and yeah, it takes a while. Um, so anything that we can do to, to speed up uh, initial compilation uh, would, would be a tremendous help to anyone wanting to run that game. Um, we already have some other folks that are doing work on a shader cache so that the second run, when you, you know, basically see cache for, sh for shaders, so that then the second run of the game, it starts up really quick, um, but the first run is still you've got time to go get a sandwich. Where by go get, I mean drive to the next city over to your favorite sandwich shop that's there and then come back and yeah. Uh, okay, so I believe that's everything that I have. Uh, any questions? Well, the Dota 2 thing still sounds better than what happens with Vine. It's still play the game. Ray, and Ray. <laughs> we have a mic. <laughs> Well, the Dota 2 thing still sounds better than what happens in Vine. You play the game, somebody jumps across the corner, tries to shoot you, and then you can go get a sandwich. Right. So, and, the, and there are, um, that, that's actually a, a separate issue, usually. Um, so, there's a bunch of games. Um, the one that, that I know of that's the, that's the worst about this for in, its, in its native client um, is, uh, is Serious Sam 3, where they have, they, they know at level load time what all of their shaders are, but they don't necessarily know how those shaders are going to get used together until they encounter things maybe much later in the level. So what they'll do is compile everything up front, and then when you get, say, to a boss and know that this shader needs to get used with that shader, they'll actually call link program to link them. And that's where you know that the boss is right around the corner because it pauses there while it's relinking the shader. <laughs> and you know, it, it seems like a silly architecture, but it turns out that's sort of the natural way to do things in DirectX, where everything is separate and you just have, you, you construct your shaders so that the outputs of one and the inputs of the other are gonna have the same layout. And then at any time you can arbitrarily say, use these two together. Um, there, that functionality is available in OpenGL through uh, separate shader objects. And as soon as I get back to Portland from this conference, I'm going to get back to working on that. So a bunch of those apps uh, will start to have a much better experience once, once that code lands. Direct X apps, uh, they always assume that feeding the shaders is cheap. Right. right. So we had this one game which times the first frame and then decided how fast to animate uh, some lips and face facial expressions. And it oh. took 10 seconds to compile and <laughs> just thought, yeah, I'm going to run that entire intro sequence in three frames. Let's better animate this real quick and... Excellent. And so then, of course, after that, after the first frame that took 10 seconds, it was hitting, it was it was hitting 60 it was and smooth. it looked ridiculous. Uh, just a different question, if I may. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote a really hacky HLSL compiler as an undergrad project five years ago. Uh, Matteo was the one to clean it up later on, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
but uh, back in that time, the shining object was to use LLVM for shade optimization. What happened to that? Um, so LLVM is kind of a pain in the behind. Um, there, I, and there's, there's kind of two big difficulties with it. Um, the first one is their story for ABI is what's an ABI? And that makes a big problem um, if you want to be able to, say, ship an updated driver on multiple different versions of distros that maybe have different versions of LLVM installed basically means, and this is what, so lots of, especially uh, um, OpenCL implementations, lots of closed source drivers use LLVM. And what they do is just, imp they pick some version of LLVM that they like, import all of its code into their project, and statically build it into their project. And the LLVM license lets you do that. I'm not going to import LLVM into Mesa, <laughs> right? And so then it means, you know, if we were to start using it, it means that we would basically be in the same situation that the Radeon drivers are in, which is you can't get an updated Radeon driver on the previous version of Fedora because of the LLVM mismatch. And I, I can't do that. So, uh, and, and then also it's, um, it's really doing code generation out of LLVM if your code generator isn't in the upstream LLVM tree is is kind of a nightmare. Um, so it's a, pro, a project interface issue rather than something, some limitation. Yeah, of LLVM I mean, I mean that's, that, that's, that's kind of the, the, the first deal breaker. Um, and, you know, the, the, that sort of architecture that they have for, for LLVM meets the goals of that project, right? So I, I totally understand why they want to do that. And, you know, it had been proposed a few times that, that Mesa should have a, a standard interface between sort of the core part and, and the driver part. And we pitched a fit about that, that suggestion, sorry, Luke, <laughs> um, for kind of the same reasons, right? That, no, we don't want to have this ABI because we want to have the flexibility to be able to take stuff that's garbage and throw it out and do something that's better. Um, and, and not have to you know, do like we do with the kernel and say, no, we have to keep dragging this old horrible interface around for years and years because it was there once. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this I should have just yeah. a little for a <laughs> <laughs> We don't have much time left. Yeah, I, I see I'm, run, I'm running out. Howdy. This is a higher level question. Um, you were quite certain you were going to start seeing shaders that use uh, switch statements in a significant way. Could you? I, the, I, I don't know. I don't know for sure that we will. Or um, just a but, graphical effect that would make use of switch statements. In so one thing that's happening is people are looking for ways to um, avoid the overhead of switching shaders. And one of the ways that people do that is with like Uber shaders. Um, and, and, if right, um, and one of the ways that you, that you could do that to be able to kind of switch between, at a, at a fairly coarse way between the behavior, different behaviors in a shader would be with a, a switch statement that selects on a uniform, for example. Um, so now that the consoles can do this in, in a fairly credible way. It's at least possible. Um, there's a couple other ways that, that people could do that. Um, uh, another one that would be similar is using, uh, there's a piece of GL4 functionality called shader subroutines, which are roughly like function pointers in GLSL that you set as uniforms. Um, there's not a lot of use of those either for, I think, mostly the same reasons that the previous generation of, of consoles can't do them at all. Um, so uh, I, I think we're kind of at um, uh, a, tra a transitional phase here where 
the things that people were previously doing because it worked on PS3 and Xbox 360, they're going to start giving up a bunch of those techniques because now they can do different things on, on PS4 and, and Xbox One. Um, and so we're going to start seeing a bunch of shaders that, you know, next year we'll see shaders that look really different from the ones that we saw last year. And, and trying to predict exactly what those things will look like is, is hard. Okay, I think it's time. Thank Thanks. you.